for Black History Month, we've decided to partner with the Haitian American Museum of Chicago, which is a place I've been volunteering with for about five years. And so I'll go ahead and introduce Carlos, who is the museum's current executive director. We also have Elsie Hernandez, who is on, and she is the founder of the Haitian American Museum of Chicago. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's super awesome to be here with you all. My name is Carlos Bossard. I'm the executive director, um, as Amanda mentioned, of the Haitian American Museum of Chicago, or HAMOC for short. Um, Black History Month this year is full of lectures for us, and we are so excited to kick off our celebration um, with the University of Arkansas Fort Smith. Amanda, thank you so much for inviting us. Stephanie, thank you so much for inviting us. Um, today, you're going to hear from Dr. Karen Richman, who is a board member at Hammock, um, as well as other things. Um, and I'll do her introduction here in a, in a second. Um, also on the line, as Amanda mentioned, we do have Elsie uh, Hector Hernandez, the founder and president. Um, Elsie, do you want to say a few words? Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's so wonderful to see all these individuals here to um, listen to um, Dr. Richmond's um, presentation. I'm Elsie Hector Hernandez. Hector is my Haitian last name, and Hernandez is my husband. Um, I am the founder of the Haitian American Museum. It was opened in 2012, in uh, November 18th to be exact, of 2012. We've been doing a lot of good work, a lot of good um, programming, and we're moving forward. So we are currently in our eighth year. So we are excited. We are full of programs. Check out our website. We are really promoting Haitian history, art, and history, so in culture. So I'm sure today is a wonderful presentation. You'll enjoy it. It's about Haitian culture, of course, and religion. So good luck, and and hopefully. Awesome. Thank you, Elsie. Today, uh, we're hearing from Karen Richman, a cultural anthropologist. Uh, she is a scholar of Haitian and Mexican migration, religion, music, family, political economy, and climate change. She is the author of numerous publications, including Migration and Vodou. Richman co-edited a special volume on Haitian religion with Terry Ray in 2012 and won the 2009 article prize in ethno-history. She is a professor at University of Notre Dame, where she, where she is director of undergraduate studies at the Institute for Latino Studies, a faculty in Romance Languages and Literatures and Anthropology, and a fellow of the Eck Global Health and Kellogg International Studies Institute, as well as an affiliated faculty of Africana Studies and Gender Studies. Thank you everyone for being here. Dr. Richmond, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. And now I'm going to share my screen. Right. Okay. So it looks like potentially she, uh, she exited the, the, the screen versus sharing her screen. Um, we'll give her just a second. I'll get her on the line really quick to get her back. While um, Carlos is trying to get uh, Dr. Richmond back online, um, I would like to um, bring your attention to Mr. Peter Vega. Peter, I know, but I think Peter Vega is one of, is the executive director of the Chicago Cultural Alliance, which is one of, um, Peter, you could talk about the Alliance if you like. Uh, I'm back online. Just I just want to say something happened when I went to share my screen from the host. Okay. Okay, Karen, just give Peter one minute while you were, were sure, looking sure. for you. About that. Yeah. Peter, unmute yourself. There we go. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, excellent, sorry. Hi, my name is Peter Vega, Executive Director of the Chicago Cultural Alliance. Uh, the Chicago Cultural Alliance is a consortium of 40 cultural heritage centers here in Chicago. And we're very happy to have Hammock as one of uh, our core members of the Chicago Cultural Alliance. And uh, please do follow the Alliance on, on social media and find out more about programs like this from the Haitian American Museum all month for Black History Month. And there's plenty of other organizations that are also hosting lots of uh, Black History Month activities that uh, you can find out about on our website. Thank you, Elsie. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanna say when I went to share screen, that's when the Zoom cut off. So, um, you should be fine if you want to try again. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure uh, to be part of this event and uh, part of Hammock. It's really been such a thrill to be a member of the board for almost since the beginning, right, Elsie? And we're just thriving um, under Elsie's leadership and with Carlos coming on as our executive director. It just, it's just uh, such a marvelous time for us and we have so much ahead of us too. Um, thank you for the introduction, Carlos. As you said, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and so I'm really going to be talking to you from my long experience as an ethnographer, a cultural anthropologist, with a particular community of Haiti, which uh, is based in Leogan, in the western um, part of Haiti. And I've been involved in this community for almost four decades. And I'm uh, I am honored to be um, a member of this community, a member of an extended family. In addition to being an academic and writing scholarly books and jur uh, journal articles and all, I'm also an advocate. I've worked for many years as an advocate um, fighting for the rights of Haitian immigrants and Haitian migrant farm workers. In fact, this whole project grew out of my involvement as an advocate for Haitian migrant farm workers. Um, on the East Coast of the United States. My uh, lecture, which I'm hoping will be about 45 minutes and then we'll leave time for a vigorous Q&A, um, is organized around these themes. What is voodoo, voodoo and Catholicism, descent groups and their spirits, a practical religion and their collectivist morality, the powers of Lua, or spirits and transnational ritual spaces. The term voodoo is a notorious racist symbol of the quintessential other. Outsiders' sensational representations of voodoo have little to do with the religious practices, morality, and beliefs of ordinary Haitians. Instead, these distortions disguise the creator's own racist imagined fears to project them onto Haitians, in turn questioning Haitians' rationality and validating challenges to the sovereignty of Haiti, a republic whose creation in 1804 out of a slave revolution defied the existing colonial plantation and racial slavery orders. The literary and media images of cannibalistic voodoo proliferated in the early 20th century and were used to legitimize a second colonization of Haiti, that is, the U.S. military occupation of Haiti between 1915 and 1934. The theme of voodoo and Catholicism. What does the word voodoo mean in Creole? It's actually an adjective distinguishing a genre of ritual music, percussion, and dance that's performed in honor of a spiritual pantheon. There was and still is in Creole no grammatically correct way to say, I do voodoo or I practice voodoo. The adjective 
comes from Fongbe, a language spoken in Benin, and it means spirit in that language. And as we know, Benin was the source of many slaves brought to the French colony, whose name was Saint-Domingue. The Creole noun for spirit is loi, which is pronounced like the French word for law. Loi are a unique combination of human and superhuman social beings who are also alien spirits. The iconography and symbolism and naming of Lua blends African and European influences. Some are identified with Catholic saints and many have African names. People who serve their Lua identify as Catholics. Catholicism is a prerequisite for worshiping Lua. As a man in Haiti once explained to Alfred Maitreau, the author of the classic text, Vodou on IET, you have in, um, to serve the Lua, you have to be a Catholic. To serve, the, to serve the Lua, you have to be Catholic. So you might ask, how can they be Catholic? Well, there are many Catholicisms or varieties of Catholicism in the world and they reflect their particular social and historical contexts. And we can't assume that the form of Catholicism that any one person practices is somehow the only authentic version that makes all others inferior or illegitimate. Now, Catholicism was the official state religion of Haiti when it was founded in 1804. Many Latin American and Caribbean Catholicism, uh, Catholics will recognize similarities to Haitian Catholicism. However, many Haitian Catholics and virtually all Haitian Protestants do not recognize and do not worship Lua or spirits. Throughout Haitian history, there's been official condemnation of worship of the Lua by the Catholic Church, especially in their infamous anti-superstition campaign of 1941 and 1942, which was led by the French Catholic Church, but abetted by the Haitian state. Nonetheless, that has not altered the centrality of Catholic ritual to serving Lua. In 2003, almost 200 years after the revolutionary establishment of the Republic of Haiti, President Jean-Bertrand Aristide proclaimed that the time was long overdue for the state to recognize this religion as an essential part of Haitian national identity. And so Vodou took its place beside Catholicism, the official religion since 1804, and Protestantism, which was officially recognized 36 years ago and has been steadily gaining ground in Haiti. The next section is descent groups and their spirits. And I'm going to be talking to you about how important it is to understand the relationship between kinship, family, and religion in this context. Evidence of the integration of Catholic ritual in Savis Loi is clear. All rituals begin with substantial Catholic prayer in French, led by a lay priest. And that would be akin to reciting the Mass in Latin. French is essentially a foreign language to most Haitians. Only about 90% of Haitians are truly competent in French, but all Haitians speak Creole. So after this period of recitation of rote um, Catholic prayers in French, the whole mood of the ritual changes. The language changes, the style of action shifts dramatically. And this stylistic break exemplifies the symbiosis as opposed to the fusion of these religious traditions, which is a theory of one of my mentors, Leslie Desmong. So what was sedate and sedentary rope repetition in a foreign language becomes exuberant, embodied, sonorous expression in Creole. It requires full participation between the participant and the spectator. And as, as you'll see in some of these images, and you saw in the first image, the multimedia ritual action may go on for several nights and days, and it involves visual, 
material, linguistic, kinetic, and oral modes of experience. It involves performance involving virtuoso drumming, call and response singing in Creole, dancing, visual art, parade, costume, spirit possession, cooking food, and offering of meals, beverages, animal sac sacrifice, and other material gifts. The focus and purpose of all of this multimedia aesthetic ritual work are the spirits, the Lua. The concept of protagonist fits the role of the Lua very well. And as protag protagonists, they are the center of attention, the guests of honor, the ones to be feasted, flattered, served, and comforted. The next question you might ask is, why do people say, msevi lua, I serve my lua? It's not a question of simply choosing to do so. Here's a picture of my friend Tishini with, uh, um, in his place in Florida. Lua belong to families, and persons come to their lua through inheritance as members of heritage or descent groups which were the primary social form of organization in the development of a free Haitian society. So heritage comes from the French word heritage and the Creole term means and connects the descent group and the land left for them by the founding ancestor. That founding ancestor was typically a former slave or a descendant of slaves who purchased land, again in defiance of plantation slavery, and left it for all of their heirs. This heroic ancestor is addressed by the title Premier Met Pitation or Premier Maîtres Pitation, the first landowner, might be a woman or a man, in recognition of her or his role in the establishment of the material resource that symbolized resistance to plantation free, uh, slavery, symbolized freedom. The descendants' veneration of the first landowner further rests on the belief that he or she directly links them to Africa, which is called Guinea, the homeland, the habitat of the Lua and the place where ancestor souls must return. Hence, the concept of heritage signifies a web of reciprocal relations between the living, the ancestors, and the spiritual members, the Lua, of these land-based descent groups. You saw an heritage assembling to serve their spirits in that first slide, and this is a picture of Tishini's part of Tishini's heritage and the compound, which is called, as Elsie knows, a laku. That's the part where people live. The kinship-based society that emerged in defiance of plantation slavery chose to envision their loa as particularistic spirits who are unique to each descent group. The bonds between the loa and the members of their descent groups, the people, are both required and voluntary. That seems like a contradiction. The way this relationship works is that the heirs may choose to ignore their relations with the Lua at their peril, but they cannot choose to worship any random Lua, that is, a Lua whose relationship they did not inherit. Unfortunately, most scholarship on the religion mischaracterizes Lua as universalistic nature gods and worship of them as a matter of free or individual choice, overlooking the particularism of the bonds between the members of these land-based descent groups, living and deceased, and their spirits. Hence, the wor hence worship is a fundamental means of recreating identity, history, and the ties of the family to their original resistance to plantation slavery, linking them all the way back to Guinea, to Africa. When Eritage members assemble to serve their Lua, 
They reenact their genealogy through meticulous invocations of each of their unique Lua and the names of all of the ancestors who have died and who served them. Inside the spirit house, which is called a Kailua, that you're, one of which you're looking at now, there's an earthen jar dedicated to each ancestor, which serves as a temporary abode when he or she comes back from a, for a visit from Guinea. When a, fa when a member of the family walks into their family shrine, they see, in a sense, a symbolic material record of their whole family history. The jars are akin to a wall of remembrance. Ancestors are the links to the spirits, the idea that they alone hold the keys to knowledge about how to serve the spirits serves to keep their memories alive. What is Sevis Lua about? As my mentor Karen Brown argued in her classic text, Mama Lola, a Vodou priestess in Brooklyn, answering this question begins with the Haitian concept of personhood. Haitians construe the person, the self, as a communal relation, not as an autonomous, independent, self-reliant individual. Personhood is imagined as a link and a bond within a thick interpersonal network. The, the person is not, indeed cannot be conceived of as the starting point of personhood. The individual cannot be conceived of as the starting point of personhood. Karen Brown writes that the religion gives its members, quote, identity, solidity, and safety in a precarious world through a thick weave of relationships with other human beings as well as with spirits and ancestors, unquote. This interdependent morality holds that the fate of any one member is inseparable from that of the group. Savis Lua requires cooperation, intimacy, and sharing among kin and is defined in opposition to the immorality of individual autonomy, privacy, and accumulation. The rituals create a stylized theatrical context for doing the moral labor of promoting reciprocity and disciplining individualism. The immoral opposite of savvy Lua is sorcery. Sorcerers, motivated by radical individualism, envy, and greed, are believed to wield mystical techniques and powerful symbolic means to hoard wealth and destroy competitors. They allegedly work privately and in secret, and they represent the immoral opposite of all that is savvy Lua. Sevis Lua is a practical religion. It, it, it favors imminence and instrumentality over transcendence and idealism. It demands an intimate, physical, material, embodied communication with the supernatural. So to repeat, embodiment is essential to this practice, entailing the spirit's physical communi communion with people. Spirit possession is the primary means for creating this material physical contact. Possession performance involves dissociation of one's conscious self to make way for the spirit to, as it's said in Creole, monte tetu, mount your head, oswa, danse non tetu, dance in your head. When it's over, the person has, is supposed to have no conscious recollection of the performance and instead learns about it through what others say. Or record. The Lua is likely and expected to arrive as in person during the performance of their own unique music and chants. Each Lua has its own, his or her own dedicated repertoire of drumming and songs. The Lua, when speaking in the head of a person, Pale Nantet Moon, tend to communicate through stylized pantomime and vocables rather than speech, requiring the members to collaborate to interpret the Lua's exaggerated and engagingly amusing charades. Moreover, the Lua typically touch the assembled, demonstrating the care that's essential to reciprocity. For example, the spirit may rub the members' heads, as you see in this image, or vigorously shake their hands, or dole out the sacralized food and drink 
directly into the mouths of the worshipers, demonstrating again the morality of sharing and reciprocity. In Haitian culture, social norms, in other words, the implicit rules of social interaction, enjoin direct confrontation. Causing somebody to lose face publicly can invite retribution and the use of sorcery. Possession performance provides a socially appropriate way to critique that um, antisocial behavior by inviting spirits to say what others dare not say in regular social contexts. Hence, when the loi communicate about inevitably involves the work of reciprocity, both the onerous demands of perpetuating sharing and helping others and the benefits of community and social cooperation. The spirits may address a variety of tensions going on. For example, the drama of the negotiations leading up to the ceremony, or they might draw attention to those who are derelict in the fulfillment of their duties to the spirits and to other people. They might ridicule antisocial behavior and expose latent interpersonal conflicts that threaten the interdependence of the community. The overarching metaphor for interdependence in the heritage is feeding. Food, of course, is a powerful symbol everywhere, and it's ripe for myriad varieties of symbol symbolic imagery. In this particular society, food is especially loaded with meaning. Haiti rose out of the ashes as the only successful slave revolution in this hemisphere in defiance of the sugarcane plantation slavery system to become an independent society of small farmers who produce their own food, of fishermen, and of Machan and Madame Sarah, Higglers, women traders, who sold the food. Feeding represents relationship. Feeding represents relationship, and in this context, it's the relationship between people and their inherited loi that's represented by the reciprocal exchange of feeding for spiritual protection. To serve, sevi, the very word for worship that we said earlier, connotes providing food. And in addition, the word for ritual is a manger loi, a feeding of the loi. So again, the way to say I worship is msevi loi, I serve loi, with the implication that it's what the loi like to consume. And the word for a ceremony is a manger loi. So dominant is the symbolism of nurture or feeding that extends to the classification of spirits. The personalities of loi are differentiated by their particular tastes in food and drink. Ritual labor demands exact adherence to these gastronomic distinctions. Appetite indicates spirit temperament. So when people want to talk about a loi being displeased, they don't say loi fashi. They don't say the loi is angry. They say loi grand goût. The loi is hungry and needs to be fed. The challenge of satisfying the hard to please persnickety spirit's appetite is another metaphor for the difficulty of maintaining reciprocity between these very human spirits and very imperfect human persons, which again is just a larger metaphor for the relationship between persons. This process typically drags out over months or even years until the kin group can muster the resources to procure, prepare, and present the requisite feast along with all of its attendant prayers, music, dance, and so on. So, uh, Looking at this image here, anybody within this community or this system would know exactly which loi was being served just by looking at this table. And if they saw this one, they would know it was a different type of spirit. So you can see the extent to which the spirit's particular tastes in food and beverage, color of food, texture of food, etc., is absolutely essential. 
Now, the Lua are thought to consume the food, the spirit of the food, the invisible soul of the food. We know when a successful feeding occurs because the spirit, having been invited to journey all the way from the spiritual homeland of Guinea, Africa, to arrive in person, that is in possession performance, to mount a member, right, mount their head, and accept the kin group's copious gifts of prayer, honorific songs, drumming, dance, etc. The Lua are thought to consume, consume the soul of the food <clears throat> of the dedicated offerings, and then the people can share the substance. In addition, the Lua who may arrive individually or in small groups, depending on the kind and size and purpose of the ritual, they typically commune with and entertain their hosts by performing virtuoso dances, daring physical feats, and humorous antics. So again, just to remind you of how, how much this overarching metaphor of food is also a language in and of itself for distinguishing the different lua. The next part of the lecture is the powers of the Lua. What powers do Lua have? In some popular and scholarly narratives, Lua are erroneously defined, as we indicated before, as universalistic nature gods. Haitians do not think that their spirits wield powers to control air, land, or water nor do they believe that Lua have life-giving powers. This myth misinformed the media's claims after the cataclysmic earthquake of January 2010, which killed several hundred thousand Haitians, that the vast numbers of Haitians felt betrayed by their nature gods for failing to prevent the disaster. Multitudes of disappointed former devotees were supposedly turning away from their traditional religion and converting to evangelical Christianity. In fact, Haitians did not reject their spirits for failing to prevent a natural disaster over which the spirits had no control. Instead, the powers of the Lua are far more limited and are confined primarily to protecting or punishing the human members of the descent groups who serve them. Lua are believed to guard their people from sorcery on the part of immoral, greedy individuals. Spiritual protection is nonetheless construed as an ambiguous affair. The Lua protect their people by consenting not to discipline them too severely, that is, neither to make them sick nor to thwart their capacities to be productive. Spiritual punishments are typically felt as polysymptomatic. They could affect physical, mental, emotional, and psychic faculties. The symptoms might include illness, misfortune, accident, property loss, strained relationships, addiction, and bad dreams. Malade Lua, afflictions by Lua, are therefore kinds of relational disease. Haitians construal of the body as porous or unbounded and consequently vulnerable to outside forces, materializes their concept of the self as a relational entity, again, instead of as an individual autonomous unit. This logic is what makes spirit possession and spiritual illness possible. Indeed, the motivation for most manger loi, right, ceremonies, is the urgent need to heal someone who's being held the word is cambe, by a particular inherited spirit. Knowledge of the sick person's heritage genealogy, which is recreated at all major rituals, as you heard, is essential for divination to reveal the identity of the gagressing loa and learn the spirit's specific ritual requirements for releasing the sick member. The arrival of that loa in possession performance to accept the dedicated offering which is oral, musical, visual, and material, is a signal of the Lua's intent to release the afflicted member so that they may be healed. The spirit's powerful sway over the heirs 
rests on their power to afflict them, no matter where they live. Lua are thought to be able to travel anywhere from their base in Guinea. This belief has been essential to the religion's continued vitality since the massive transnational exodus of Haitians that really intensified in the late 1970s. Migrating members of Eritage do not escape the orbits of the mobile Lua. Indeed, they, migrants are often the prime choices of the avenging spirits and, the pri and they become the primary sponsors of the rites taking place back home. And the further conviction that the only appropriate place for a healing ritual is on the family land back home is an even more powerful factor that keeps migrants tethered to their spiritual anchors in Haiti and through Haiti all the way back to Guinea. In the 1980s, a transnational Haitian community based in Leogan, the one I've been part of since then, and in South Florida, creatively adapted tape recorders to transcend their long distance separation. And they stayed connected not just to one another, but also to their ancestors and their Loa. They appropriated audio cassette recordings in order to perpetuate and revitalize the ritual communication practices of their heritage. Thus, when migrants could not personally attend the services, they participated in a delayed fashion by listening to the rituals. The migrants could witness not only the sounds of the performance itself, drumming, singing, prayers, and chatter, but also the voices of narrators, like what you see in this picture that you saw at the very beginning, and hopefully it makes more sense to you now, uh, the voices of the narrators describing what the listener could not see, including the climactic arrival of the spirit protagonist to party with the hosts, both immediate and at a distance. Spirits in possession performance were observed indicating their awareness of the long distance participants by approaching the tape recorder sometimes and speaking or singing right into it. And since the 1980s, the tempo of participation across this vast performance space has kept pace, of course, with developments in recording and communications technology. Some of you don't even recognize the tape recorder. What is that thing, right? And the community has enthusiastically embraced video recording and, of course, simultaneous broadcasts through mobile phones and the internet. So if we can pause for a moment uh, in this picture, um, this ritual was sponsored by a man whose nickname is Little Sound, Tisson. He was sick in Florida and he he sent back word to the family and over a period of time, resources were gathered to put on a ritual to um, uh, appease the spirit. It was diagnosed, of course, which spirit it was and they knew exactly what the spirit would want. And this picture that you saw earlier was taken from inside the tent. So right, be right beyond um, where the spirit is dancing there, there is the table laden with all of the foods that the spirit uh, has in this picture has already arrived to accept. And the members of the um, uh, Tisson's family are gathered. The spirit has chosen Tisson's mother, uh, Ticome, as the vessel uh, through which to appear. Uh, the man in the foreground is her father, who's a, a, a ritual leader or gangan or priest. You can tell by the ritual, by the special insignia, the rattle he's holding in his right hand, uh, as is also the man standing next to him and across from him. And then behind, uh, to the rear of, of uh, uh, the spirit inhabiting Ticome, is Tisson's stepfather, who's speaking into a cassette recorder. And he is narrating the flow of the events for the absent sponsor so that he can participate vicariously in this ritual when he receives the tape. So this is one of the, um, just one moment in this ingenious way of 
adapting um, what now looks like primitive recording technology to the exodus of people and their new transnational lives. So to conclude, Haitian's vernacular religion is a decentralized, heterogeneous system organized around local kin groups that trace their identities to resistance to plantation slavery, economic freedom, and ownership of land. Members of ritual units include the living, ancestors, and inherited spirits, or lua, whose powerful sway stems from their ability to afflict members wherever they reside, including abroad. The only remedy is collective ritual involving food offerings, Catholic prayer, spirit possession and performance, music, dance, parade, and animal sacrifice. The embodied performance promotes reciprocity and disciplines individualism's threat to the unit's social and moral life. Unfortunately, outsiders' exotic images of voodoo typically confound the system of service loi with sorcery, its polar opposite. In racist movies, graphic arts, comics, narratives, music, and text, this key distinction is collapsed and the whole complex system is reduced to immoral acts. In these racist visions of the people who pose the greatest challenge to plantation slavery to date, these fake images of voodoo usually portray the heroic descendants of the revolution as greedy, depraved, sexual deviants and cannibals, everything they're not. I hope that this talk has given you a few tools to combat these images and de has deepened your understanding and respect for the complex, intricate, interdependent moral system that Haitians call service loi. Absolutely fantastic, Dr. Richmond. Thank you so, 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 so much for that. Just, you know, I think the thing that really sticks with me and that you just kind of touched on too is kind of Western culture's look at what voodoo is, you know, and, and me, you know, being at the Haitian American Museum of Chicago, you know, I'm consistently and constantly learning. And this was something, and this is a topic um, that I think is extremely powerful for myself, but then also, you know, to share that knowledge because it's, like you said, the complete opposite of what, of what Western culture thinks it is. Um, and that picture that you just had up, it's, I, I think that's a really great, like, picture of just everything that you're talking about, the, the instruments, the tapes, the, the loi, the, the offerings, everything. So I, I think that's really great. Thank you so much for sharing um, your experiences and your knowledges, some really great visuals too. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to hear one of those tapes, you know, sometime just to, just to hear how it's being trans, like transcribed and translated to, to family members and folks who aren't able to be there at that, that point and moment. Well, uh, my book actually, uh, I was one of the first to produce a CD along with the book. So the book came with a CD. And when the book was republished two years ago, there are links to the internet. Uh, you can you can hear you can hear them all. Yes. Okay. I, I think we'll have to find those, and uh, we'll send like a follow up email so everyone can check out the book. You can check out the recordings. Um, thank you for for all of that. Um, we do have about fifteen minutes just for some Q and A. Um, if anyone wants to put some questions in the chat, um, I will kind of moderate this and relay relay the questions. Um, we do have one question um, that came during your lecture. Um, so it says, hello, Dr. Richmond. You talk a lot of Haitian practitioners of Haitian voodoo to relation to place and space, right. particularly in relation to La Cou and in connection to the first Haitian homeowners. The question is, how might have this relationship changed as a result to the social and economic changes following the U.S. occupation? Well, thank you for the question. It's a great question. And um, the U.S. occupation hastened a lot of processes that were going on in Haiti um, at the turn of the um, 20th century. Um, and one of those was centralization. And the uh, 
undermining of the peasant small farmer plantation system, uh, I'm sorry, farming system, and the swelling of Paul Prince, right, which was never built to house so many people. And so uh, there was a crippling of the port cities uh, that used to be very vital and had their own trading relationships. Laogan even had its own, where I've been based, even had its own trading relationships with Europe. So the crippling of the port cities and the centralization of everything on Port-au-Prince and of course, stealing peasant land, killing peasant resistors, crucifying the leaders and displaying their bodies on boards. Um, you know, all of this led to uh, ur rural urban migration and people having to leave their family lands and also being dispossessed of their family lands. So it was a variety of processes. And all of that, of course, intensified with Americans insisting on importing food. So yet another challenge to the small farming system was importation of foods that would undermine peasant production. All of that has intensified. And let's just say plainly, the US has never let go of its neo-colony, right? Haiti's a de facto colony and these processes greatly intensified. So one of the things that you see developing, and I, I've written about this elsewhere, and, and this is one way in which my work complements and contrasts with that of my mentor, Karen Brown, is that in the urban setting, people set up a congregational form of worship that some people have referred to as temple vodou. So there were cult centers or temples set up in the capital where you could join based on your um, relations to the other people in the temple, maybe the, the leader, the unga or the mambo, if it was a woman, and it wasn't based on kinship. They might, it might be overlapping, but it wasn't based on an heritage, a descent group. And so that's really a, a congregational form. And that, of course, became very well adapted to migration. Right, so from one city to a huge city. And so what we saw in New York and what Karen um, Brown described with uh, Mama Lola is the beginning of uh, temples in New York where people could serve the Loa. And I highly recommend uh, the film Legacy of the Spirits made by another Karen, Karen all of us are Karen, Karen Kramer, um, which features people who have set up cult centers in uh, or temples in New York. And the membership of these temples often involves non-Haitians, um, other Caribbean um, uh, uh, Americans, etc. cetera. So um, one of the creative responses then was to move toward congregational vodou. And what's really interesting there is the, that uh, you do have a, a more of a choice in the Lua that you share, that, that that you share relationships with because it's not based on these landholding descent groups. Nonetheless, the idiom of family becomes very important. So these temples are referred to as houses and people who become initiated or become members of them refer to one another by kinship terms as, well, they, they call themselves kai, like children of the house and they'll refer to one another through kinship terms like sister, brother, cousin, et cetera. We do have another question that just came in. Uh, it says, hi, Dr. Richmond. Thank you so much for your beautiful lecture. I love the happy smiley face. Um, what do you think has contributed to the misrepresentation of Haitian culture involving voodoo and religion? How can we rejuvenate its imagery? It's fundamentally um, because Haitians dared to do what one person called the atomic bomb in the late 18th century, which was that they revolted. And I see Leslie Balango Bear is on here. And as Leslie knows too, Saint-Domingue, the, col the colony of France in the Caribbean, it wasn't the only one, but it was the biggest, represented one fourth of France's wealth at the time. And France was the most powerful uh, metropole at the time. And unimaginable that the slaves would blow the whole thing up. They've never been forgiven for that, right? It, 
they've never been accepted and and Haiti was isolated for much of the next century the US which should have been an ally right because the US was the first independent nation state in this hemisphere Haiti was the second only you know quarter century later but instead of forming an alliance they helped lead the isolation why because this country was predicated on owning black slaves right and our president at the time was a slave owner so that's why Haitians never get a break because the the, the hegemonic white controlled world has never forgiven them and is afraid That's a very good point. How do you think um, we can, like, I guess the second part of the question, how do you think we can rejuvenate? What what can we do, um, you know, as, as learners, as educators, as scholars, as people to help, you know, make the the image of, of Haitian voodoo, I don't want to say more accepted, but, you know, just rejuvenate and make it more in a positive light? Well, I, um, I, I think it's two things. One is knowledge is power, just understanding all of this. And, um, respecting people and asking them what they believe. I mean, were Haitians ever asked if they thought the Loire could have could have prevented the earthquake? You know, um, but I can think of, say, a wonderful book uh, by Kate Ramsey called The Spirits in the Loire, which shows the heinous barbaric acts that the U.S. Marines committed on Haitians during the U.S. occupation. OK. They did horrible things to Haitians, including crucifying Charlemagne Perrault and Batterville to, to doors and, and exposing their, their bodies, which have become right mythic imageries, imagery for Haitians and depicted in famous art. So instead of like recognizing those barbaric things that the Marines did to Haitians, we invent ideas about Haitian cannibalism. Haitians eating Congo stew. And there were all these books that came out at the time with grotesque images of Haitians, like depicting them as monsters. So part of it is the, the displacement of the guilt and the shame for what they did to Haitians. So, so understanding the facts is very important, very important. And, um, you know, respecting people and not othering them. Yeah, I think, you know, at, like you said, asking them what they believe, you know, ask, ask them how they're feeling about things in their experience. That's, you know, that's perfect. Another question uh, just came in. It says, uh, currently Haiti has a young population. Many Haitians are concerned about the religion staying as a part of the culture. What is the status of the religion now? There, there are lots of trends going on. Um, one that's dangerous for Sevis Loire is the widespread um, range now of evangelical Christianity, which it, if you convert, uh, the first thing you have to do is literally destroy any sacred objects that you have in public. So it's predicated on an absolute disavowal. And uh, this is the, the trend toward even fundamentalist Christianity is a widespread in the world. And in Haiti, um, it's very, it's increasing um, dramatically. Uh, you can't, in Laogan, you can't really be anywhere without hearing um, Protestant uh, services, prayers, and all of that, um, which are beautiful in their own right, but it's it's really ubiquitous now, and it is defined absolutely um, against, right, in denial of these practices. So th some people think that there are well over 40 percent now in the Haitian population, and among Haitian migrants, it's even higher. So um, Whereas when, when Protestantism was accepted as Haiti's second official religion, it was maybe a maximum of 20%. So it's really grown dramatically. Um, Catholicism, uh, as you saw, uh, is necessary for serving Loire, right? 
Um, but it would be an absolute mistake, as I said, to uh, assume that all Catholics serve serve Loire, right? There are many Catholics who are franc catholique right? They're straight Catholics. They don't serve their Loire. They didn't inherit Loire, etc. So um, that's one of the, the key trends that's going on now. So uh, one of the positive things, too, is there are many people who serve their Loire who are... Um, forming organizations and recording their recording um, and preserving practices and they're using contemporary technology to do this. But in many ways people see these these um, practices as backward. They get a message often um, because of the ubiquity of especially Christian um, narratives and um, broadcasts that you can't advance um, if you hold on to these ideas. And I've seen it very much in this one community. Interesting how things kind of change and shift and, you know, dangerous things that kind of come out of that, but very good information to, to be aware of too, how, how it's, you know, molding into something different, something, you know, a little different. Um, we have in here, um, and we'll make sure to get this to the group as well. Uh, the name of the book, um, Dr. Richmond, that you just mentioned, I believe it was The Spirits of the Lua. This, uh, uh, hold, the Spirits and the Lua, I can get it right here. The Spirits and the Lua. Very nice. Yeah, we'll make sure to get uh, that information from you too, and uh, we can share that around. Yeah, and I just want to make it clear that this isn't meant as a critique of any particular religion, including, you know, evangelical Christianity, which has so many positive things, right, and is so important in its own right and needs to be respected. Oh, yes. Thank you, Rebecca. You put that in the chat. Very nice. Very nice. So it is in there. We'll make sure to, to get that to everyone. We do have another question that came in. Um, hello, Karen. Really nice to see you and thank you very much. Do you have any sense about how shifts in technology, for example, away from cassette culture towards WhatsApp, Facebook, et cetera, may have impacted the transnational sacred practices you describe? And or might you be interested in speaking a bit more about voodoo re regionalisms? Um, as in the diversity, well, um, so first of all, um, People have been very creative and in adapting these technologies. And so you can, you know, if you have enough battery power, like where I, where, where these, um, this community is based, there still isn't, you know, uh, access to electricity. So if you have enough battery power to film, you know, a ritual, it can be, people can be consuming it right away, right? So it just makes the connections even more instantaneous. And um, uh, it's, I would say that it has um, extended, it's, it's extended the worship. It's, it's definitely extended the, the ritual space. Um, about Vodou regionalisms, if you mean by different differences of practice, um, I think that the New York versus Florida example that I gave is is very relevant here, because the community that I'm talking about that still owned their own land, right, when they came to Florida in the late 70s and early 80s, they didn't set up temples in Florida. They didn't endeavor to, to do that, but they extended their um, ritual practice based on the idea that the spirits had to be served, could only be served on the family land back home. Whereas um, those who were already divorced from land, who were already urban migrants, right? Like Mama Lola adapted that practice of the, con the congregational form to city life in, in New York. Well, thank you, Dr. Richmond. Thank you all for being here. We are at four o'clock and we just want to be mindful um, of time. Um, 
I really quickly just, again, want to thank Dr. Richmond for, for being here today and sharing all of her information and experiences. Um, we'll make sure to get some resources out, uh, some links to her book. Check that out. I'm, I'm super excited to look at that myself. Um, I do also want to thank uh, Amanda um, and Stephanie from the University of Arkansas Fort Smith for allowing us to be in collaboration with you for Black History Month. Um, and hopefully we can do future things and programs. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here as well. I am just gonna put a quick plug in for some of our upcoming events this month. Um, so today was Haitian Voodoo Spirituality is the kickoff to four lectures that we're having at Hammock Virtual Lectures. The next one is on Friday, February 19th. We are talking about the power of oral histories with Dr. Courtney Joseph. Um, who donated her oral history dissertation research to Hammock last year, and we're working to, to get those uh, available to the public to, to share with everyone. Also on Sunday, February 21st, uh, we have a lecture with Dr. Cranston Knight on the Rwandan genocide. Really much looking forward to that part of Dr. Knight's lecture series here at Hammock for 2021. And then lastly, on Thursday, February 25th, there is gonna be another collaboration um, with Black, what is it, DuSable Black, oh my goodness, I want to think, Black Heroes Matters, um, which is honoring John Pat Baptiste Point DuSable, featuring uh, Hammock founder and president Elsie Hernandez. So we are much looking forward to that as well uh, later this month. Amanda, I'll pass it off to you and uh, we can wrap it up. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming and doing this with us for Black History Month. And I think Stephanie put in the chat the upcoming uh, events for Black History Month at UAFS. Lots of thank yous in the chat too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love it. Very good. Well, everyone, uh, have a good rest of your afternoon. Uh, if you do have any further questions, comments, anything, feel free to reach out to the museum at info at hammock.org. Um, we'll get Karen's contact information as well if you want to reach out directly to her. Um, but yeah, thank you again, University of Arkansas Fort Smith. Thank you all for being here uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.